our failures. But now the waters of change wash over my head. I do this because I know who I am. I do this because I'm forgiven. I do this because he rose. I know no water can change me, but this water is a sign that change has occurred in my heart. My life will never be the same. So now I'm proclaiming it to the world. And just as Jesus was buried, I will be buried. Just as Jesus rose, I will rise. Faith, hope, love, none are greater than these. I have faith that Jesus is who he says he is. I have hope in his resurrection and his everlasting power. His endless love has forever changed my life. Good morning, Vision Church. We are so happy you're here today. If you did not know, today is Baptism Sunday for us, and so we're excited. Uh, I I think I said a couple weeks ago we had seven signed up for baptism. Uh, Two of those we're going to have to reschedule, but we got five today, and we're excited about that. And then that just uh, gives us something to look forward to in in a few weeks or a month or so to try to plan out another one. And if you've been at Vision long at all, you know when we do baptisms, there's no golf claps, okay? For what baptism represents, we go crazy. We join in with heaven and the angels, and we, and we shout, and we clap, and we cheer these people on. Um, this is kind of nerve-wracking for them, to be in front of everybody and to be dunked in water, right? It's not just standing in front of people. Now we have to get dunked in water, and so we're going to encourage them. We're going to cheer for them. We're going to celebrate what God has done in their lives. And also, I want you to remember to pray for them as they're taking this step. Uh, we know the enemy attacks and tries to uh, snuff out that flame. And so we want to pray for them and surround them with encouragement. Uh, For us as a church, we we believe baptism is so important. But I do want to say this, just so there's no confusion. This is just normal water. Uh, There's nothing special about this water. What's special is what's already occurred in their lives and what God has done in their lives and uh, so this is just representation of their sins being washed away, of them dying to their sins and coming back in, um, to life in Jesus. And it's also following the instruction of Scripture, which, which Jesus set this, set this pattern for us that we are to do this, that even Jesus himself did this. And so we're really, really excited about this. So well, I'm going to start with Gracie because, well, Layla, Layla was like, I want Gracie to go before me. So this is Gracie. If you guys remember, yeah, come on. If you remember, she was one of our uh, youth that went to camp. And uh, go ahead and turn around this way because I'm right-handed. It's a little bit easier. Uh, and uh, if you guys heard her testimony, it was amazing that she was sitting in camp not sure about the whole God-Jesus thing. And she heard the words, I love you. And she was like, I know that was God. And so she trusted in Jesus. And so we're excited about this. So go ahead and scoot this way just a little bit. All right. Do you need to hold your nose? Or are you okay? okay. Go ahead and hold your nose. Uh, Gracie, have you trusted in Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Yes. And do you want to be baptized? Well, it's my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And you can step out this side if you want. Yep, you're all wet. Oh, that is awesome. Let's go, Layla. Let's do it. You ready? All right. Y'all, this is Layla, and if you're a vision person, you know Layla. And uh, we love Layla. We love her family. She's been coming for a while, and it is amazing to see the growth that she has had. And she's been eager. She's been like, can I, can I, can I? And so we finally got to have a conversation. And, man, it was great to hear her, what, what she believes Jesus has done in her life. And so this is, this is awesome. Do you need to hold your nose? Okay, hold your nose. Uh, uh, Layla, have you trusted in Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Yes. And would you like to follow in believer's baptism? All right, well, it's my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. (laughs) 
All right, Lainey, you want to go? This is Lainey. She was another one of our youth that went to camp, and God did amazing things in her life. And she was one that she said, you know, I really just want to get back right with Jesus, that she's like kind of just drifted away. He wasn't my priority. And she says, I want to make him my priority. And so she said, can I get baptized? I was like, absolutely. So, Lainey, have you trusted in Jesus as your Savior? And would you like to be baptized? All right, it's my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Come on, sailor. Are we are, are we all good family wise? All right. I'll put that, I can put that over there if you want. There you go. I'll get that stuff for you. All right. This is Sailor, and she uh, had been going to VBS, not just ours. This is what I love about this. She'd already attended VBS and other churches, and God had been working in her. And then she came to our one day VBS, which her family has been coming here. But uh, and then she, on her own was like, oh, where's Pastor Nathan? I want to talk to him about baptism. I want to uh, uh, know Jesus. And so I got to talk with her. She answered all the questions. She said, I, I love Jesus. She knew what Jesus did in her life. And she said, I want to be baptized. And you've been very excited, right? All right, sailor. Well, scoot over here just a little bit. Yeah, there you go. Do you need to hold your nose or are you good? All right, just hold on my arm then there. All right, sailor, have you trusted in Jesus as your savior? And do you want to be baptized? All right, it's my privilege to baptize you, sailor, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That is amazing. Um, so now I get to do something that's really special to me. This is my brother, Matt. And I'm going to get to baptize my brother, which this means a lot to me. But uh, uh, he, he said he wanted to just share a few words. And I've already heard his story, but I just think maybe for someone here, they need to hear it too. So just uh, there you go. All right. Um, yeah, I've been thinking about this a lot. and. Uh, I think the devil has definitely prevented me from kind of turning over and surrendering my life to God like I should. Um, if you know, maybe you don't know, the last four or five years of my life has been pretty rough. I was I had a lot of things out of my control, relationships, my company, um, you know, and I have to confess that there was a time that I prayed and told God to sit down because I was going to take over. I was sick of praying and not getting an answer. Um, and so whenever Nathan preached on presumptuous sin, and, you know, kind of this idea of actually choosing to do something against what God, we know God, you know, may have for us. Um, I've done that a couple times in the last four or five years. Uh, I was in a relationship that I actually was told by God that if I got into it and stayed into it, it would end very poorly for me, which it did. And then, um, like I said, later on, praying to God that um, I'm going to take control. And today, I just really want to say that I don't want to be in control because it does not work. Um, it's been awful. And I hope to share my testimony a little bit more in depth. Um, I've got to know a lot about myself, my mental health, um, addiction, which is something very serious. And so I'm happy to do this. And I'm just confessing that, you know, I, I want to sit down and let God take over. So I appreciate the opportunity. Well, Matt, you've trusted in Jesus, your Lord and Savior, right? Yes. And you want to be baptized again. Yes. All right. Well, it's my honor to baptize you, Matt, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Vision Church, and we just want to say again, welcome. We're so glad you're here. If you're a visitor and this is your first time, and we hope you feel welcome in this place. Um, we're going to go ahead and enter into our time of worship. Um, usually we have like a big intro song to go into it, um, but today coming out of this and seeing the symbol of coming death to life, we're going to start a little bit slower, a little bit lower, because um, we know his spirit's in the room. So would you go ahead and pray with me? 
Father, we thank you this morning, God. We celebrate this gift of baptism. But God, while the water doesn't save us, this is a representation of what you have done for us from the inside out, that you have made the dead alive again through Christ, through that promise, through that blood, through that sacrifice that God sent his son while we were still yet sinners. He sent him into this world to make a way for us to have an intimate relationship with him again. There's no barrier, no veil, nothing holding us back. So God, we praise you and we thank you for that. God, we thank you that your spirit is in this room today with your people. That God, you are still saving. We've seen that today. You are still transforming. You are still changing and healing. And so God, we ask for you to do um, what only you can do and change us. Continue to change us, God. It doesn't matter if we've been saved um, our entire life for 25 years, for a week, for, since yesterday. God, you are working in your people, God. We just need to be open to the power of your spirit in our lives to surrender our control. So God, this service is yours. This time of worship is yours. You are worthy of all of our praise, and we believe in who you say that you are. So we praise you. We bless your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Yes, you're worthy of it all. You laid down your life for us. I don't deserve nothing, but Father, you laid it down for me anyway. How thankful that I am. I love you, and I lift up your name, Father. Worthy, worthy. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let your spirit move in this place, Lord. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. Father, I pray for each one that was baptized. Touch them. And Father, as we, as Christians, Lord, that we will help them along the way, encourage them, pray for them at all times. Because it's a battle. But we know who wins. Through your help. Be with the pastor as he brings the word. Anoint his words. And again, fill this place with your spirit. There is a sweet, sweet spirit. In Jesus' precious name we ask. Hey, church, grab your Bibles. Turn to Psalm 127. Psalm 127 in your Bibles. Uh, I just want to let you know that I, I believe, unless God just moves in a, in, a, in a crazy way, I believe next week will be our last week of this series. Um, it's been, in total, it'll have been a 13-week series, which is pretty, pretty crazy. And we didn't even really scratch the surface of all the Psalms. And this is from even also thinking about two or three years ago, we did summer and summer Psalms and... Uh, there's still plenty more, and so I love the Psalms. I encourage you to continue to dig into them, and I think it's a good good uh, habit that in your Bible reading time, you just always, before you're done, just go read a Psalm. A lot of them aren't, they're not too long. Just go read a Psalm to help kind of exhort you, encourage you with the rest of your day. Uh, man, what an awesome Sunday. Uh, baptisms, worship, I don't know about you all, but that's just like, for me, that's like, perfect way to have a, a church service just to get me excited about getting in the Word, get me excited about what God is doing. So I hope that it has prepared your heart for the Word of God. Uh, I want to ask you again, pray for the ones that got baptized. Um, encourage them. Don't just, don't just pray, for them, for, pray for them from a distance, but, but encourage them to their faces. Talk to them. Tell them how proud of them, uh, you, how proud of them you are and that you're there for them. Just, just surround them with love. Uh, please do that. That's what the church is uh, here for. And so today's psalm is titled, A Psalm of a Sense of Solomon. So right off the bat, we know this is a psalm of King Solomon. Uh, the, the author is King Solomon. He is the son of King David, and he's also known as the wisest person to ever live. Uh, we went through Ecclesiastes. Oh, it doesn't seem that long ago, but it's probably been over a year ago. And um, that was awesome. That was Solomon. That was his wisdom that he's learned from all of his mistakes, and he had a lot of them. Uh, the, the wisdom that he had gained and the wisdom that God had granted him to then for us to, for us to learn from. And so that's who is writing this. And then it said, a psalm of a sense of Solomon. So what is a psalm of a sense? Well, there's a group of them there. So when you see that, 
What this means is that many people would travel from all over. They would go on a pilgrimage to worship in Jerusalem. So for wherever they lived, they would pilgrimage for a long ways trying to get to the temple. And as they're on their pilgrimage, as they're on their journey, this is a pilgrimage song. This is a psalm that they would sing on their way to worship in Jerusalem. And then on top of that, this is also a song that people, mainly the priests, but all all the people that were going to worship would sing as they walked up the steps to worship in the temple. Which I think is just really cool is that they didn't wait till they got to the temple and say, okay, now we're let's time to worship. They woke up, and as they walked to the temple, they're worshiping. As they're going up the steps, a psalm of ascent, right? We're on a journey to the temple to worship God. This is a song that they would sing. Maybe you do this when you worship in the car on the way to church uh, as you're trying to not scream at your kids in the backseat. But maybe you find time when you get up in the morning. Maybe you turn some music on as you're getting ready. Uh, But I want to encourage you, if you don't do that, I know that's like almost impossible at times. Try to find space in the morning before you get to church to already start preparing your heart for worship, to start worshiping before you even get here. Because it's a powerful thing, and I think you'll see a change in your life as you do that, as you come ready to worship. You're not waiting for that first song to then wake you up to be ready to worship. You come ready and uh, with your heart prepared to worship God because you've already been worshiping. Now, Psalm 127 is also known as a wisdom psalm. There's a group of psalms, and these, this is one of the wisdom psalms, which it's from Solomon, so that makes sense. And I, so that means that this psalm is really wanting to teach us something. It's, a, it's wisdom for us to learn. And so as I read Psalm 127, it's only five verses. As I read it, I want you to open your heart. I want you to receive the wisdom that Psalm 127 is giving to us. It says, it says, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit, of the, womb, uh, 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 the fruit of the womb, a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. So right off the bat, we almost feels like this is two separate things. It's like Solomon just like, once again, Psalms do this often where it's like they have a first section and then they just shift topics. But I'm going to see how these all fit together in a really beautiful way. Uh, Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you for getting to celebrate and open our service and worship through baptism and through seeing people step out in a visual representation of of a way of what you've already done in their lives that we get to worship through celebrating uh, these people coming to know you or rededicating or coming back to you or whatever uh, you worked in their life, God, we celebrate that and we thank you for that. God, I pray for the other people that might be uh, sitting here in this place or even watching online, God, that if they've needed the courage to to take that next step, God, that maybe this today would be that for them, Um, God, and maybe there's somebody that has wandered far and they've heard, they've seen these people uh, and and they've heard the testimonies and and God, that they would, uh, it would stir their heart to want to come home to and come back to you. God, we pray today that your word would speak to us in a very clear way, God. I pray that this wisdom psalm would speak to us, that we would not just read it, and talk about it, but we would apply it to our lives, that we would learn from what your word is saying. And God, that your spirit would give us discernment and wisdom to understand this psalm. God, we pray for conviction over us, that every single one of us is, sin- or is a sinner, and we're in desperate need of a Savior, we're in desperate need of you, and so convict us of the sin in our lives, that right now we can just repent of them and give them to you and that you would forgive us of them we praise you god that you are one that forgives and then we can walk in the way that you've called us to we can walk in the this the newness of life that you've paid for by the blood of your son jesus so god speak to us today let your spirit move in this place we love you pray this in jesus name amen so so if we look at this psalm in in total uh, all five verses This psalm really is laid out. It speaks about three basic parts of a person's life. 
We see this first part, which is really about working, this laboring in vain. When we're not doing it, when it's not God working through us, when we're not doing it for God's glory, we're laboring in vain. So work, that's something that almost every person can relate to, is that you work at some point in your life. And then the second part, he's talking about the watchmen and, and, the, and not sleeping well and these things. And so we see this idea of protecting what maybe you've worked for, right? Like you work to have a nice house or, or, or whatever it is, and so you, you protect those things and you watch over those things, you don't want someone to take those things from you. And so we see this, this almost this anxiousness of protecting what you have. And then the last few verses is really about raising a family, which once again, I know not everybody's parents, I know not everybody uh, has kids, but uh, many people can relate to being one of the, the, the core parts of a person's life is working, protecting what you have, and raising a family. And, and the wisdom given by Solomon in this psalm is very simple. It, it, it is very simple. It might be one of the most simple things in all of Scripture, but as simple as it is, not even Solomon was able to do it, at least not do it perfectly. The answer and the wisdom in this psalm is total dependence on God. And whatever you're doing, if you're raising a family, you have to, I mean, come on, parents, you, you need God to help you with that. Like, like you need to depend on God. In that. And if you're not leaning on God, if you're not trusting God, if you're not depending on God to give you the strength to do it, it's going to be a lot harder and a lot more issues with it. I'm not saying parenting is ever easy. But we got to depend on God for that. If, if you're thinking about the things you have in your life and you have anxiousness, you're anxious, anxious thoughts about holding on to what you have, not losing things, not, not, not people leaving you, whatever it is, the, the wisdom here is, well, you need total dependence on God. And if you are working and working and working and you feel like you're getting nowhere, you feel like it doesn't matter, you feel like it's in vain, the answer is total dependence on God, which this should be the overarching uh, message of a Christian's life anyways, is that in every aspect of our lives, we fully depend on God. Think about it this way. The root of sin in our lives, and all the way back to Genesis, is self-reliance. It's lacking to depend on God. It's looking to something else to, to fulfill us, to serve our needs, our desires, that's not God. And so this is the root of all sin. For those of us that know what sin is and what God calls sin, when we decide to, to go against that, what we're saying is, I know better. I don't need God in this area of my life. I'm self-reliant. I, I don't need God for this, so I'm going to do it my own way. And it's this lacking to depend on God. The self-reliance. Now listen to me, understanding and applying this truth will change your life. I'm not exaggerating, that's not a pastor thing, like man, the word of God changed your life, it does. But this specific thing, dependence on God, ha has so much potential to change your life completely. And I believe today could just not be another church service and not another Sunday. I believe today, in, 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 as we break down this psalm, could be a turning point in your life, in your marriage, in your family, in the way you parent, in the way you work, in the way you treat your friends, in the way you treat your enemies. Every single aspect of your life, this can be a turning point if we can get this wisdom and we can get this truth, this total dependence on God change the way you work and the way you rest and the way you serve and the way you parent and the way you treat your family. So let's start with just the first part. I just want to start with the, the first half of the first verse. So, so look at verse one, just, 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 just the first part. Unless the Lord builds, I want us to get that. You can apply that to every part of your life. Unless the Lord builds the house. Those who build it labor in vain. So, so the part I want to just sear into our minds today, unless the Lord builds. And in fact, you could even shorten that to unless the Lord. Unless the Lord is involved, unless the Lord's the focus, unless the Lord is in it, unless the Lord is leading us, unless the Lord is commanding us, unless the Lord is doing it, we're laboring in vain. 
And so if you're taking notes, write this down. you got to depend on the Lord in your working. I'm not just talking about your jobs here, by the way. I'm just like in your working, in your living, in your building, in anything you're doing in your life. In your working, in your toil, you have to depend on the Lord. See, the, the idea is that you would depend on God in every part of your life. But it's interesting that Solomon emphasizes work laboring in vain, right? See, I think work is one area that depending on how long you've been doing your job, you probably feel somewhat confident in. Like if you've been doing a job for a while, you, you're, you're, you've got a rhythm, right? You feel pretty good at it. You can kind of, maybe some of your jobs, you can maybe even do, and it's like muscle memory, right? Like you could almost do it in your sleep. You've been doing it so long. But what happens when we just start doing things, and you've heard me say this before, getting on cruise control and just going about life, just, okay, this is what we do. We get up, we shower, we brush our teeth, get in the car, we go drive to work, we do that, we come home, we make dinner. Like, when we just get into this, like, boring cruise control rhythm, we start to just, like, distance ourselves from the thought of God. That's why Scripture's so clear, like, make God always on your mind. Like, you need to be thinking about the things of God all the time because we so quickly forget who he is, what he's doing. That's why the Psalms, many of the Psalms we've covered has all been about about remembering. Remember the Lord. Remember what he's done. So if you feel pretty confident in your job or what you do, maybe you do it really well. Like you know your job. You're, You're really good at it. First of all, praise God. That is amazing. God has called us to do well, work well, be good at what we do, and he gets the glory for that. So praise God if you do your job really well. But when that raise comes or that promotion comes and you you start to feel that pride creep in, the psalm is a warning against the danger of overconfidence in one's self. So, so I'll say this way, don't forget who gave you the brain to do your job. Don't forget who gave you the strength to do your job. Don't forget the one that has provided this job for you. He, he is in it, and, he, and it is God doing it. And when you remove him from that, and you're like, it's all me. I don't really need God for this part of my life because I've kind of got this under control. I feel like I know what I'm doing here. I need God when things go crazy. I need God when the train runs off the tracks and whenever there's health issues and and whenever I don't know what to say to this person in this conflict. But in this area, it's pretty chill. It's pretty calm. I don't really need God with it. Well, we've missed it, if that's what we start to think. The danger of overconfidence in oneself. Overconfidence in ourself causes us to depend on God less. And we start, to, we start in this place, especially as Christians, we start in this place where the, the, the initiation of our salvation is understanding that we can't save ourselves. That's where we start. And so full reliance on God. God, I need you to save me. I need you to make me new. I need you to forgive me. It is all God doing everything. It is Jesus that went to the cross, not me. And so it's, we lean completely on him. But as we start to live our lives, it's, we start, start to lean less on him and on ourselves. I got this. I know what to do. Yeah, I could stop and pray about this, but this really isn't something that needs prayed about. I, I, I know what to do here. I know how to handle this. And we just start to maybe kind of forget God in the everyday sort of things. I, I love that Jesus gives us a straightforward reminder in John 15. If you look at John 15, verse 5, he says, I am the vine. I love this illustration, by the way. He says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. And this is what I want us to get. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And, and I'll word this way, nothing that matters. You can do stuff. You can do busy work. There are plenty of people that aren't Christians that are doing some pretty amazing things. They're building some pretty amazing companies. They're, 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 they're advancing science and technology. They're doing some pretty cool stuff. But at the end of the day, none of it matters if you're apart from Jesus. See, the idea isn't, it isn't to not work. I want us to get this. The idea isn't to not work and just say, well, God does all the work. The idea isn't that we cannot build anything without God. The idea is that when we do anything without God, then it is done in vain and without meaning. 
in God's kingdom and eternity, it really is in vain. So Solomon himself serves as a warning to us for this. Like, and I say it not even necessarily a warning, but it's just an example of the way it can go wrong. If you know Solomon's story, uh, he, he's the richest and greatest builder of all time. He built kingdoms and palaces and cities, and he built and built. He was a mastermind at building things. He had all the riches he could ever want, all the women he could ever want, anything he wanted he had, but he ruined the kingdom through his pride and self-reliance and rebellion of God. Having everything but missing one thing. And if you miss the one thing, which is Jesus, if it's God being Lord, right? It is God being sovereign over your life and acknowledging that and him leading everything in your life. It doesn't matter how many kingdoms you build. They don't matter without God. In Ecclesiastes, Solomon says he has everything he could ever want. And he built everything he desired. Look at Ecclesiastes 2, verse 11. Then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil I had expended in doing it. He sat back, looked at his kingdom, surveyed it, and he considered all that his hands had done, all the toil that he, all the work he'd done, everything he'd built. And he says, and behold, this was a, a light bulb moment for him, all was vanity and like striving after the wind and there was nothing to be gained under the sun let us learn from the life of solomon who had everything that we would all dream of right like that like if i just had that my life would be better if my bank account was just this it'd be better if the house if i had this and, and if we just did the kids would do this and if if the family would do this and if my boss would just do that and if, if we had everything perfect then everything would work right this is a warning to the man from the man who had everything and he said at the end of the day behold all was vanity it was like striving after the wind it didn't fulfill him it didn't do anything it was all in vain none of it mattered so I'll say this again. There are many billionaires and famous artists who have built amazing things and do not acknowledge God. But the emphasis for us and for our souls, the emphasis isn't on temporary results, temporary things. But the emphasis is on the eternal kingdom. And without God, it is all insignificant. And so just to take a little breath here, what is your life focus? What, what is your mind uh, focused on? What are you wanting to build? What is your attention on? What do you spend time dreaming about? What is that thing, if I had it, would fix everything? What is the focus? And then hear the words of Solomon who had what you wish you had. To say, listen to me, I got it all and it, it, didn't, it wasn't anything. It didn't fulfill me. It didn't. It wasn't beneficial really to anyone because it wasn't pointing them to God. It's all in vain. So I'll say this, and I want you to fill in the blank in your mind. Unless God builds whatever that is for you, where's the tension in your life now? Unless God is the one working in my life, in my workplace. Unless God is helping me parent, and that's what's going to lead us to the last half of this. Unless God builds this in my life, unless God is behind it, unless God is in front of it, unless God is in it, if he's not doing it, it's all in vain. And it will not fulfill you. It will leave you feeling more empty than ever before. Total dependence on God. We must live our lives with constant reliance on God. It's not just parts of our life like, God, I need you here, but I don't need you here. No, we have to understand we need him all the time for everything. Every breath that we breathe is a gift from God that we are dependent on him to let us breathe. We are fully reliant on God. 
And this is what I love about this. We think about depending on the Lord in your working, whatever that is, in whatever area of life you're trying to build and you're trying to grow, or maybe your literal job, whatever it is, this is what I love about this. Every day, for believers, for Christians that know Jesus, every day, believers get to live like a kid with his father on take your kids to work day. We get to labor in view of God by the power of God and for the glory of God. And it brings meaning and purpose in everything we do. So what if that was the mindset as you go to work, as you parent, as you do things in your life, as the mindset was like you're just tagging along with God and you get to see him on display working in you and through you and sometimes for you and many times for other people and most importantly for his glory that frees us of so, many, so much anxiety, so much stress that it's not about me providing and doing everything I can. It's about me just running towards Jesus, running towards God and letting him work through it. This is what brings meaning to our work. It's not just doing things now. It's we're serving the kingdom of God. We're doing what he has led us into and called us to. And it might be what you think is the most boring, mundane job possible. And I'm telling you, with God in the center of that, with the Lord building in that and working in that, it can be one of the most significant jobs to ever exist when God gets in there and works. So whatever, whatever you're doing, wherever you're at, total dependence on God. Depend on the Lord in your working, in your living, in your going, in whatever you're doing. Total dependence on God. And then that's what brings meaning to our work. So let's read the first to first and verse two together because they, they flow really nice. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. We have another unless. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil. Now now listen to me here, because this is the key. For he gives to his beloved sleep. You you weren't designed to eat the bread of anxious toil because he gives to his beloved sleep. So if you're taking notes, write this down. Depend on the Lord instead of worrying. And I want to be honest. I'm a hypocrite preaching that. Because I'm a worrier. I've told you before, I'm a kind of an anxious person. I worry about how is this going to work out in the details of this and what if this happens. And I have all the scenarios in my head of what could go wrong. That's what keeps me up at night. That's the reason I, I go to late, uh, late to rest and I wake up early and can't go back to sleep is because of worrying. And the psalmist here, Solomon is saying, hey, listen, you need total dependence on the Lord. And part of that is it helps you to overcome worry. And so when you feel worry and anxiety, let the, let the warning light come on to you. Okay, there's something here that you need to depend on God for. Because anxiety is a result of you trying to do it in your own strength and fix it. Now, now I want to be clear here before anybody misquotes me. There are clinical anxiety, right? Like there, there's, there's med- med- medications and things out there to help with that. But most of our worry is just a sign and, a, and it's a warning light saying, hey, listen, here's an area that you're not trusting God in, that you're not leaning on him, that you're not depending on him for. We've got to depend on the Lord instead of worrying. This, this section of this psalm, I believe, is providing wisdom to the overthinker, to the overworker, to the worrier, to the anxious person. And, and I think overthinking and anxiety and worrying often is what leads to us overworking because we're trying to do it in our own strength and we're trying to fix everything. We're trying to make everybody happy because we're worried if, we're not, if they're not happy, then this is going to happen and this is, it's going to cause all this. And so it's like, if I just work more, I just won't sleep tonight. I'll just think through all the scenarios and try to solve the world's problems and not sleep. And then tomorrow I won't be able to think straight because I haven't rested. And then I'm going to be more anxious that I can't remember what I even thought about last night. Somebody relates to that. See, I think the key to understanding this is actually found in the last three words of verse 2. His beloved sleep. His 
beloved sleep. He gives to his beloved. There's a possession there, by the way. We are his. Praise God. Like if, if, you, if you are a Christian, you are his. You are not your own. You are his. He gives to his beloved sleep. He's giving. He's generous. He, he's loving. He cares for us. He wants us to rest. I feel like this has been another common theme for the last this counting today, the three weeks in a row, we've talked about rest. If we look at 1 Peter 5, 6, and 7, many of you, I know this is, I've heard this before from you, that, that this is your favorite scripture. And it's a good one. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him. Why? Because he cares for you. See, that's the part I think that a lot of us miss, and that's something that i, I got to get in my head. Is like, it's not that God's just like, hey, stop worrying about it. Get over it. What's your problem? No, it's, it's because he cares. It's because he loves me, that I'm his beloved, that I'm his. And that in itself, knowing that I am loved by the God of the universe, of the God of everything, the sovereign God of everything, and he loves me and he cares for me, that should be enough for me to close my eyes and rest. That my God holds me. That I'm His. It is out of God's love for you that He provides rest and commands you to trust and depend on Him. Solomon uses an illustration of a watchman. And the picture I get is a watchman. These cities would have watchmen so that raiders wouldn't, an army wouldn't come and overtake the city. So the watchmen would take shifts and they would stay outside the city and they'd be on watch in case an enemy came and then they would let everybody know and they could get prepared to defend themselves. So he gives this illustration of a watchman watching on the wall, watching all night, worried, what if they come? What if they attack? What if they come from that way? Well, I'm looking this way. What if they come from behind me? Okay, we got to get somebody over there. Okay, I can't sleep tonight. And people are saying, hey, it's my shift. Let's, let's switch. No, no, no. I got to make sure nothing bad happens. We have this anxious watcher, this watchman, so worried that someone might come attack the city that he cannot rest. And Solomon gives us a humbling reminder. It is the Lord who watches the city. It is the Lord who watches the city. I'll say this. It is the Lord who watches over your family. Now, you are called to care for your family and defend your family. But it is the Lord who holds your family. And it is the Lord. Like, like I think a lot of us, and, and don't get mad at me, don't throw anything. I think a lot of us are feeling really anxious about the political climate feeling very anxious about the upcoming election, and we're going, oh, no, and we're trying to think how we can fix that. I'm not saying we don't have any power, right? We should stand up for what is right and, what is, and, and stand against what is wrong. But listen to me. It is the Lord who watches over our country. And it is the Lord who, who surrounds the world. And it's the Lord that holds the universe together to keep us from inching any closer to the sun and burning alive, right? Like it is the Lord that holds it. And so somebody needs to hear this today. Let me humble you and myself that you staying up at night worrying about it, it's not fixing anything. And in fact, if, if you wanted to, a lot of it, it is out of your control. But you know who, who has control? God, it is the Lord who watches the city. And he says, listen to me. It's, it's pretty smart to have watchmen ready to defend. But if you're losing sleep over it, you need to understand that unless the Lord is watching the city, there's not really anything you can do about it. It is the Lord who watches the city. I think this can be applied to all, of, all areas of life. I already said this, but for me, anxiety and worry hits me at night when trying to sleep. And my, my, my brain starts asking questions. Am I doing enough? What if this happens to my family? How am I going to handle this? What if, what if my son 
got sick or needed this and how, okay, he's getting ready to start school Tuesday, pre-K and uh, I'm having trouble dealing with that. But I'm also thinking like, what if he gets bullied at school or if something happens there and I'm not there to, you know, and, and then you start to worry, okay, church, what if I'm not doing enough in the church? What if people need this and, and I got to be there for them and oh, I forgot to call this person today. And, uh, and then I start thinking about the world and I look at how messed up the world is and I start thinking, okay, how can, what can I do to fix this? We could start a ministry and we could try to get over there and we could, and next thing I know, the birds are chirping and the sun is out. And I feel miserable. What many of us do in our worries is feel like we have to fix everything. So instead of giving it to God and resting, we work harder. We double down. No, I just can't sleep. I got to think this through. I got to do this. I got to get up. I got I to handle this. I'm going to go into work early. I'm going to stay late. I got to do more, do more, do more. And this scripture calls this toiling, laboring and toiling. Listen to these words. See if you relate. It is in vain you rise early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil. Why is it in vain? Well, one, you're just killing yourself. When you don't sleep, when you don't rest, like all signs points to this, our bodies, God designed us to rest. And if you don't rest, you don't think right. You're not going to be a better parent if you're sleep deprived. You're not going to be a better worker at your job if you're sleep deprived. You're definitely not going to be a better servant for God because you are going to be easily agitated, annoyed with other people, and you're just not going to be able to think because you're sleep deprived. But the second thing, why is this in vain? Why is it in vain to just not rest? And, 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 to, and a lot of us, we glorify working hard, right? Well, why is it in vain to, to, to not rest? Well, most importantly, it's in vain because, listen to me, you don't hold the world together. God does. And so when you are staying up trying to fix the world and worrying about the world, what you're really saying is, God, I don't know if you got this. God, I don't know if you can handle this. I don't know if you're, are you in, are you in control right now? Like, like, our world looks like it's on fire, God. Like, are you there? Like, do you care? I'm starting to think maybe you're not there, so I'm going to have to figure this out. That makes all of our staying up late and overworking in vain. Studies show that people who are sleep deprived suffer higher levels of anxiety ulcers, panic attacks, and always make more mistakes, which leads to higher stress. And I believe God wants us to have a healthy rhythm of work and rest the way he's designed. Work is a blessing, by the way, when it's done in the Lord, for the Lord, in the way he's designed. When we get outside of God's design for work, it becomes a burden and it becomes toil and it becomes laboring and stressful. But rest is a blessing from God. In fact, it's almost like he has designed our bodies that when we refuse to rest, he's like, I'm going to shut you down. I'm going to force you to rest. I've designed your bodies to basically pass out and force yourself to rest. And I believe this healthy rhythm of work and rest happens with dependence on God. When we're depending on God, when God is the focus of our lives, when he's the purpose and the goal is glorifying him, when we are fully dependent on God, that's when a healthy rhythm of work and rest happens. Our worry reveals where we trust God the least. So remember, every night when you go to bed, you have an opportunity to express your trust in God by resting. Like, think about that. Like, our world looks at resting as laziness, right? Which we know laziness is a sin, but, but God-given rest like the way God is designed in this, when we get to lay our heads on our pillows at night and shut our eyes and clear our mind and just think of the things of God and give all of our concerns to him, we get to express worship and we get to worship God in our rest by saying, God, we trust you. I'm not holding everything together. You are, so I'm going to trust you in this. As I sleep tonight, there's no telling what can happen in, in, in the five, six hours that I'm sleeping, but I'm going to give it to you and trust you. 
We, we, we get to reveal our trust in God in our resting. Because remember, he gives to his beloved sleep. I want just, just take a deep breath. Breathe that in. He gives to his beloved sleep. God doesn't sleep, and he is always working. He's working in our rest. He keeps the world turning. He holds it all together. He is sovereign over it all. So rest. So I'm going to say this before we move on to the next section because they flow right together. This is one I can relate to. I'm sure many of you can. Mom or dad, you don't have to hold it all together. Rest. Now, obviously, you got to be there for your kid. And when they get up in the night and they puked everywhere, you got to get up and clean it up, right? Like that's just part of it. But understand and don't put all of that weight on you. I've seen so many, especially moms, you got to be super mom. You got to do it all. You got to be there. You got to have it. You got to make the memories and you got to try to be happy while you're doing it, right? And you're holding it all together. Listen to me. You don't hold it all together. God does. So rest in that. That leads us to the next section. Look at verse 3. Behold. It's a big moment. When Scripture says behold, that's like, listen up. Behold, children are heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb, a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies at the gate. This is our third point here. You got to depend on the Lord for your family. And really all these points mesh together is because in everything we do, we depend on the Lord. And I see this with so many. We, we were a church filled with a lot of family, a lot of kids, a lot of families and a lot of kids. You have to depend on the Lord for your family. It's, what's pretty cool is in Jewish tra tradition, this psalm is recited as part of the Thanksgiving service after a child is born. They would recite this every time a child was born. It was just a, a tradition. Let's recite this. The children are a heritage from the Lord, and they would recite this together. This psalm is, a, is a reminding us that children are always, listen to me, children are always to be viewed as a blessing and not a burden, no matter how they came into being. No matter what that looks like, children are always a blessing, and they are to be treasured. Now, we must not make idols out of our children. We see this a lot. But we most certainly should treasure them and thank God for them. I love that verse 4 tells us they're like arrows because something about like children and being like a weapon just fits. I don't know, like, because their children can be very violent at times. But, but verse 4, like children are like arrows in the hand of a warrior. And, and, and this is what I want to say. All children are arrows. And families, the question is, where are you directing them? What, what, is, what is the target are we directing them just to always make straight A's? And if you don't, I'm going to be mad, right? Like, are you directing them at just being a good person? Are you pointing them at Jesus as much as you can? Remember, it's out of your control. God, God's got your family, but our job as parents and grandparents and families and a church family is to see our children and say, okay, I know you're an arrow. I know at some point you're going to go flying. But until that day, I'm going to point you as much as I can towards Jesus, and I'm going to show you who he is and why, see why he is the aim of our life, and he is the target, he is the goal of our life. So where are we pointing our arrows? The goal is to aim them to Jesus, and then someday you've got to let them fly with faith that knows God holds them. I love the illustration that Solomon uses in verse 5. He says, blessed is the man with children because... When the enemy comes to the gate, the man has backup. Is that not kind of a cool illustration? I, I never understood that. Why would the man be put to shame when the enemy comes there? Well, it's because when the enemy shows up and looks through the gate, he's not just got one arrow pointed at him. He's got a family that's all pointed at him saying, maybe think again about trying to hurt our family. Maybe think again about trying to come in here and take this. 
And the reason I love this illustration is because many of us, we're probably not worried about having backup when the enemy comes to try to take our city. That's probably not our primary focus and our primary worry. But the idea is that godly children go up to protect their parents and their family. That part of this, we see two sides here. We see children being a heritage of the Lord that parents are to take care of and point and guide and love them to Jesus. And then we see the other side of it is that these children would grow up and then care for their families, care for their parents. Not let anybody take advantage of their parents. They're going to be there. They're going to take care of them, whatever that is. Now, listen to me. I know that there's families. There's different dynamics. There's so many different things that come, that they come into families. And, but, but I want us to just see that. I know many of you in this place or in this stage of life now, you are caring for your parents. You are protecting them. You are helping them. You are uh, nursing them. You're you're taking care of them. You're you're driving them to doctor's appointments. You're doing those things. Praise God for that. But remember, the whole point of the psalm is about dependence on God. So even in doing that, we don't start to think, okay, it's all on us to do this. We still have to depend on God in doing that. So whether you are a parent or you are caring for your parents, or a loved one, you are called to trust God in the process. And that's what's crazy about this. Our world, the idea of work in our world, and doing things in our world, and building our world, is it's just like paired right with anxiousness, and toil, and stress. But in God's kingdom, and with an eternal mindset, work and rest go well together to where then we can care for our families, we can parent, we can care for for our parents, or or our grandparents, or, or elderly, or orphans, or whatever it is. We can then serve God's kingdom, and we don't feel burdened, and stressed, and anxious about that, but we know that God's hand is over it and we just work with joy. We just serve with joy. Now, I want to be clear. I, know, I understand that not every person has children for one reason or another, and I know that's a sensitive topic, and so I want us, when we read this, I know it could be like you almost start to feel guilt about this. I don't want you to feel that way. But it is clear that, that, that as the church, we are to value and treasure children And we are called to care for widows and orphans and the elderly and all the vulnerable, especially in our church. And we do this not in our own strength, but with the full dependence on God. It is all Him. You gotta depend on God. You gotta lean on God. You gotta know that God is there and He's with you. And when you're up late because you gotta work or you gotta take care of the kids, God is there with you. Use those moments to focus on the things of God. Don't let anxiety and worry and stress creep in. Focus on the things of God, the promises of God. So let me close with this. I'm just gonna kind of rephrase some of this. Unless God is being glorified in your workplace, you labor in vain. Unless God builds your home, you parent in vain. Unless God is building this church, everything we're doing is in vain. So, first and foremost, we're not making sure that God is in line with our plans. And I think that's where a lot of anxiety comes from. Because when I pray sometimes, I naturally am like, God, this is my plan. Now, make it happen right and then I start getting anxious when my plans aren't working and they're not happening but but the goal is not for me to present a plan to God and say okay now you do it the goal is for me to say God what is the plan what do you want to do not what I want what do you want to do where do you want me to work how do you want me to lead my family how do you want me to serve in the church how do you want me to serve outside the church what do you want for me Because I recognize that, God, if you're not in it, it's all in vain. I recognize that if you're not in this church and you're not doing it, what we're doing is all in vain. It can be fun. It can be nice to see each other and sing good songs and have fun stuff for the kids. But if God is not in it, it doesn't matter. The goal is for you to be set free today of self-reliance. So whether... You're a person that just deals with stress and worry and overworking, or you're a parent that feels like you have to do it all right, have to have all the answers and have to always be super parent. 
Let me set you free of this. Like, let, not me. Let God set you free of this today of self-reliance. You don't save yourself. Right? Let's go back to our salvation. You don't save yourself. You don't keep yourself saved. God does. The whole world isn't depending on you or your perfection. And God isn't asking for your perfection because He knows you're a flawed sinner. He's asking for you to trust Him. And yeah, you're going to make mistakes sometimes. And He's like, hey, hey, yeah, trust me. And we're going to learn from our mistakes. Solomon had a lot of wisdom. Why? Because he made a lot of mistakes. But you got to trust him. So my, my question would be, can we do that today? Can we, can we place our full weight on God? Our worries, our stress, our anxieties, are all cast on him, all given to him. All of our dreams, all of our hopes, all of our desires, all of our wants, we just lay them to give them to God. Now we just throw them onto him and we say, okay, God, what do you want? Because I trust you. I want to end with a verse we referenced last week. So our prayer team will be down here as we pray and worship. So if you need anything at all, we want to pray with you. But I just want to, before we pray, I just want to reference Matthew 11, verse 28. We said it last week, and I just think it just speaks so nicely. This is what Jesus says. He says, come to me. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So that's what I want us to do now. I want us just to come to Jesus. Father, we thank you, God, that it is not on us to save the day. It is not on us to be per perfect. It is not on us to be strong enough. It's not on us to save ourselves. It's not on us to keep us ourselves saved. It's all you. So God, as we pray, as we seek you right now, as we come to you, as you have called us to, and you said, come to me, God, we come to you now. And there are people here that are tired, they're heavy laden. They've been laboring and toiling in vain for so long. They've been trying to work their way to be good enough for you. They've been trying to be the perfect parent. They've been trying to be the perfect Christian. They've been trying to do everything right. And they are tired and they are stressed and they are anxious. God, we come to you now. And we take a breath and we exhale and we just leave it all at your feet. We pour it all onto you. We cast it all onto you. We throw it all to you. So we say, God, we trust you. We understand that we are fully dependent on you. But we want to just declare that we trust you today. We trust you in our families. We trust you with our world, our country. We trust you in our church, God. Help us to trust you. Help us to depend on you fully in every area of our life. God, if there is anyone that does not know you, I pray that today would be the day that they would put their true trust in you for the first time. God, that you would forgive them, save them, wrap them in your arms, and adopt them into your family. We love you, God. Just have your way as we pray and worship. This is all for you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Father's love
special this service was for those that had a public display, God, of accepting you through baptism, God. We thank you for the plan of salvation. We thank you for the ones that followed through with that, God. We pray that you'll be with them on their spiritual journey, God. It doesn't mean that it's going to be easy they've accepted you, that they've been baptized, but God, we pray that they will fully, fully put their trust in you, God, as, as Nathan talked about today in the sermon, God. We pray that as Christians, we could draw inspiration from those um, who came forward today and were baptized. God, we pray that every day we want to be missionaries, disciples for you, God. Share your word, Lord, with others every single day. 
putting our trust in you, whether it's work, school, parenting, whatever it is, God. We pray that you'll be with those who couldn't be here, whatever the reason is, God, sickness, um, whatever it may be, we pray that you'll reach down and touch them. And God, I pray that we could take this message and apply it to our lives. Be with us throughout the week, God, in any way that we can be used to share your word, God. I pray that we can lean into that. Be with us throughout this week. Be with us as we travel today, Lord. We thank you again for the service. We love you and we praise you. It's in your name I pray. Amen. All right, church, so I know I say this a little bit every week, but hang with me because we do have some important announcements. But if you have questions about baptism, if you have questions about the gospel, about Jesus, about how to get plugged in here at Vision, there's connect cards in the backs of the seats. Um, you can scan that QR code, and it'll go to our online connect card, um, and we'd love to have a conversation with you. So please do that. I encourage you to do that. If you were baptized this morning, do not leave without seeing me. I have a card for you um, before you head out. Um, and just a reminder of our church, we've said it a million times, but to continue to pray um, for those that were baptized today for protection over them and their families and that God would bring people around them to our people to exhort them and encourage them um, and keep them accountable to have those people in your life that you know um, that you need to keep the faith, to keep going. Um, so be praying for them. So the one main thing I need y'all to know about is I announced it last week, um, but we host, last year was our first year, but hopefully it'll be an annual thing, um, but a dinner for our high school football team. Um, so this year it'll be Friday, September 6th um, from 3.30 to 4.30, but we need some people to help set up, come here early, probably about 2.30, um, and some people to help tear down a little after 4.30. Um, so if that's you, if you're interested in helping um, set up or tear down if you're helping or if you're interested in helping serve food um, to the players please let us know we'll have a sign up specifically um, just for people to serve in that way next week what we have out in the lobby um, right in front of the connect desk this week is a sign up list for if you would like to donate food so I believe we're doing like a taco nacho bar that's what we did last year and it was a hit um, so there's a list out there if you'd like to provide desserts um, one of the items for that we need all the help we can get our football team is pretty big so we want to be able to love on them and have plenty to eat before that game um, that night I believe against Harrisburg um, so we're really excited to be doing this make sure you sign up in the lobby and again we'll have a sign up sheet next week um, just for people to set up tear down serve food stuff like that so I think that's our main stuff for this week. I'm sure I'm forgetting something. So if you're no vision students tonight at 5.30, um, on a little break just with the back to school, um, and I'll announce when they're back full for that. But thank you for throwing that up there. Um, if you're ever curious about what's going on, please download um, the Church Center app. We have a calendar on there that we try our best to keep up to date, but it'll let you know what's coming up um, for the month, for the week, and we have some exciting things to be announcing for the fall. So we love you, church. Um, again, thank you to all our visitors that are here today. We hope that you feel welcome and feel loved. Fill out those connect cards if you have any questions, and we'll see you all next week.